after he left, they can continue to wait. Yeah. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, for folks on the phone, we have Sona here in the office at the Coastal Conservancy. Um, so you're going to get to hear her talk. There's also some Conservancy staff in the room. Um, for questions, you can go ahead and put your questions. Yeah, we'll get to that. <laughs> you can put your questions in the question pane that shows up on the webinar interface. Um, and we can be answering those as Sona is going along in the talk. Um, and we can also save them towards the end. Uh, so yeah, just go ahead and put those in whenever you guys think of your questions. And we'll also have time for kind of a larger Q&A at the end. Uh, so take it away. Thanks for being here. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Um, so yeah, my name is Sona Monat, and I'm a senior program uh, manager and policy analyst at the Greenlining Institute. Um, for those who don't know, Greenlining is a racial and economic justice public policy organization. We're just down the street, based in Oakland, um, and we advocate on behalf of communities of color and low-income communities in the state. Um, and so today, I'm really excited to share a report that we recently came out with called Making Equity Real in Climate Adaptation and Resilience um, Policies and Programs. And the reason we are calling it making equity real is because I'm sure all of you know that equity is becoming a pretty popular buzzword. Um, but as it becomes more and more mainstream, there's a real risk that it can turn into an empty promise or commitment if we don't have a strategy on how do we actually make it real and operationalize it. Um, because for us at Greenlighting, we want to make sure that equity is not just a commitment, but it's an actual practice that we're all working towards. And so today, I'm excited to share a framework that we've been developing on how to make equity real in adaptation and resilience. Cool. Just a quick overview of the presentation. I'm going to share uh, what our, I think, the key outcome is, and I hope you'll all leave with um, by the end of the presentation. Um, I'll provide a little bit of historical context on why social equity matters in adaptation and resilience. Um, and then I'll introduce our Making Equity Real framework. And finally, I'll share some examples about how that framework can be applied to policy um, and program work that we're doing. Uh, so a key outcome for this webinar is really education and co-learning. And hopefully you'll all understand the key takeaways from the report and understand how we're using it as a foundation for policy strategy to advance equity in um, adaptation and resilience. And before diving in, I just wanted to share uh, this image here. I believe A10 um, recently presented at this office too, and so this might actually be familiar, but I wanted to uh, ground us with sort of what is our vision for community resilience and what are the values that really went in the, into the foundation of producing this report. And so the image on the left here that you see is from our partners at SEHA, and it represents what the Transformative Climate Communities Program hopes to achieve. Um, achieving this vision, this idea of community resilience where people are connected, we have a lot of renewable energy, transits available for everyone, it requires strengthening built infrastructure and natural systems, and while we're doing that, really centering communities, especially the most impacted, who have been historically overburdened by the extractive economy. And so in the short term, the image on the left, is that we want to prepare neighborhoods and communities for different climate disasters that they might be experiencing. But in the long term, we really want to make sure that we're building power and addressing underlying systemic inequities that are creating a lot of the um, oppressions and injustices that we're seeing in our communities today. And so I just wanted to start with this vision because the idea is that our framework and our guidebook that we produce will hopefully help us get to this vision. So I'm going to share a little bit about um, why social equity matters in this space. Um, so for over two decades, Greenlining has been working to advance racial and economic justice in communities of color in California. And our organization cares about climate issues because race, even more than class, is the number one indicator for where toxic and polluting facilities are located today. These facilities are predominantly located in low-income communities of color, and as a result, these communities face a number of environmental injustices, which I'm sure you can imagine if you live um, next to a lot of these polluting facilities here. And since climate change exacerbates all of the inequities that communities might be facing, low-income communities of color are often hit hardest time and time again when climate disasters strike and have the fewest resources to adapt to these disasters. But as we know, 
the injustices that we're seeing didn't just show up today, but they're the result of generations of discriminatory policies that have created the sort of inequities that we're seeing. And so the location of black and brown communities near sources of pollution comes from early government policy from the 1930s, which we all know as redlining. And just curious, how many folks here are familiar with redlining? Okay, great. Um, and so just a short recap, in the 1930s, in the middle of the Great Depression, a lot of families were struggling to make ends meet. And in response, federal housing agencies began issuing government-backed mortgages to help post-war families build wealth through the Depression. To figure out how to distribute these mortgages to help families, governments worked with bankers and realtors to create maps, like the one we see here, to identify which neighborhoods to invest in based on credit risk. And Oakland and other East Bay communities were one of these neighborhoods. And so they created a grading system based on several different factors, like quality of housing. But the primary indicator of risk was race. And the neighborhoods were graded based on a color code. Green meant best, blue meant still desirable, yellow meant definitely declining, and red meant hazardous. And areas that were redlined were seen as credit risk because of the presence of people of color. And this is where the term redlining comes from. So for example, this is a 1937 audit from surveyors for the city of Oakland. And it was common to see offensive language here like infiltration of Negroes and Orientals as a detrimental influence and the reason for the area's redlining. And to illustrate how egregious this policy was, the government literally had a manual that said, incompatible racial groups shall not be permitted to live with each other. And between 1932 and 1962, the federal government provided over $120 billion of loans to help families but over 98% of that money went to white families. And so at a time when white Americans were building wealth to pay for their children's education or to buy a home, which we all know that home ownership is one of the primary ways to build intergenerational wealth, communities of color, particularly black communities, were locked out of these opportunities and it's led to the um, extreme wealth inequality that we see along race lines today. So redlining didn't just impact economic conditions. As people of color were locked into crowded inner city areas, they were also selected as dumping grounds for urban sources of pollution and contamination. Highways were also used as a way to separate black neighborhoods from white ones and were often constructed directly through black communities, exposing them to a lot of transportation pollution and other negative health impacts. And I wanted to share this image here because in 2018, the California Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment did an analysis, and what they found is that 89% of people in California who are living in the poorest, most polluted, disadvantaged communities are people of color. And this image here compares the East Bay redlining map with a current day map of Cal and virus screen, which identifies communities that are suffering the most from poverty and pollution. And what you'll see is that the communities are, that are in red and orange that are suffering the most clearly track to communities that have been redlined over 80 years ago. And so while redlining is one example of government sanctioned policy that created inequities along race lines, it's not the only one. Since the founding of this country on the genocide of Native people, to slavery, to Jim Crow laws, to the Chinese Exclusion Act, to Japanese internment, and to ICE detention centers that we see today. Race has always determined the winners and losers in this country. Centuries of discriminatory policies essentially put handcuffs on black and brown communities from being able to accumulate wealth, power, and resources. And it's important to remember that this history wasn't just created by a few bad actors, but that these were all deliberate public policy decisions carried out by local, state, and federal governments. And so while government played a, a huge role in creating these inequities, government can also play an immense role in addressing them. And that's the message that at Green Mining we want to bring to our policymakers, is that as we move forward and develop new policies, we have to acknowledge how race-based policies created and continue to perpetuate the inequities we see today. And what do we see today is that the 
cumulative effect of redlining and so many other oppressive policies have resulted in extreme segregation, disinvestment, and poverty and pollution in communities of color. And all of this has led to a climate gap where communities of color and poor communities are disproportionately affected by climate impacts and have the fewest resources to adapt. And these, these headlines here are just kind of there to illustrate that point, but I feel like every time we see a new climate disaster, the same sort of headlines appear time and time again. For instance, communities of color often lack the financial well-being that can really serve as a lifeline during disasters, like having access to a car or living near um, safe public transit to escape a climate disaster, or having enough savings in case you're unemployed or experiencing displacement. And so as we're thinking about creating new adaptation policies, it's critical that we center equity to protect our most impacted communities. And so to do that, how do we actually center equity in different adaptation and resilience policies? We want to see strategies that provide comprehensive multiple benefits. Because as we just saw, climate disasters don't just impact the physical environment where we live, but can exacerbate any sort of existing health, socioeconomic inequities that we're experiencing. And so the strategies that we want to see are ones that, oh no, sorry. Uh, build the resilience of physical environments, create better health outcomes, enhance economic opportunities, reduce exposure to pollutants, and finally, continuously engage with communities and work to empower them. And so now, I want to share how our report recommendations can help get us to creating these sort of strategies. And so in developing the report, or we call it a guidebook actually, we did a landscape analysis of over 30 different California policies and grant programs to assess how are they currently advancing equity. And what we found is that the majority of the initiatives didn't meaningfully embed equity. And by that, I mean, they didn't have the robust community engagement that we wanna see. They did not target funding to marginalized populations, or they didn't advance multiple benefits, like the ones I shared in the previous slide. And overall, most of the programs we reviewed did include a few equity elements, but it wasn't really baked into the entire effort. And the concern is that when policies and programs and different investments are created without an intentional and meaningful consideration of equity, what we've seen is that racial inequities tend to be reinforced, forgotten, or in some cases exacerbated. And so in our report, we created a scoring system for all of the programs and policies we reviewed. And I have some examples here, uh, but the full assessment is available in the guidebook. So knowing this, how do we operationalize equity or make it real? And if there's one thing that you walk away with from this presentation, it's these four steps that I'm about to share. So for any adaptation resilience effort, we first wanna see equity embedded in the goals vision, values of any sort of effort. Second, it has to show up in any processes that are created. And this really gets to the community engagement piece. Third, it has to show up in implementation. And finally, it has to show up in analysis. And so now I'm going to provide examples for how equity can show up in these four categories for different adaptation and resilience efforts. <clears throat> so, the first one, for goals, equity can't just be a talking point. If an adaptation effort is serious about creating equitable outcomes, then it has to make that explicit in the goals of the effort. And an example I wanted to share is the Our County Plan um, for the Los Angeles County, their sustainability plan. And this plan outlines what local governments and stakeholders can do to improve the well-being of every community in the county while reducing damage to the natural environment and adapting to a changing climate. And the plan is organized around 12 different goals. And I chose this example because equity is not one of the 12 goals, which is what we often see, but it's embedded in almost all of the 12 goals. And so I just wanted to share some examples about how the goals here reflect equity. So for instance, goal number one is to have resilient and healthy communities where residents thrive in place. And the goal explicitly says that the county will protect low-income communities and communities of color from pollution and reduce health and economic inequities. <clears throat> Goal number three 
is around equitable and sustainable land use. And it talks about development without displacement, which is a really important equity consideration for us. Goal number eight talks about creating a more safe, reliable, and affordable transportation system, and specifically considering residents with limited mobility options that can impact access to economic opportunities. So I highly recommend anyone who's interested in learning more about what these goals look like in practice to review the Our County Plan. Um, and we're, we're also tracking the implementation of the effort to make sure that the implementation um, matches the intent of these goals. Uh, but again, we really like this example because for us, equity shouldn't be siloed into its own category or section, but it should show up throughout an entire effort because our communities require multifaceted intersectional solutions to address the injustices they're experiencing today. For example, a community that's protected from flooding but is under threat of displacement is not truly resilient. And so in the second step is process. And this really uh, gets to how do we develop equitable processes to ensure that communities have opportunities to influence and drive decisions. And a good example that I wanted to share for this is LA County's Measure A, which passed in 2016, and aims to provide safe, clean neighborhood parks and beaches for the county. And as part of the process, the Board of Supervisors approved a countywide comprehensive parks and recreation needs assessment to identify park need in the area. And the map on the right shows park need with red being very high and green being very low. And the entire process for this assessment involved significant resident engagement, and it included workshops for the 178 study areas where community members could come together, review the parks in their neighborhood, what sort of priorities they have for the park, and be able to um, create a list and see which ones they could actually advance. And so now the data from this assessment can be used to equitably allocate funds to areas with high park needs while making sure that the park projects respond to community needs that came out from the workshops and the resident engagement that they did. The third step is centering equity and implementation. And this requires understanding community identified needs and developing implementation strategies that can help build resilience while responding to those needs. And so I wanted to share an example of a collaborative effort between PODER, which stands for the People Organizing to Demand Environmental and Economic Justice, and the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. So PODER is an EJ group, they're based in San Francisco, and they essentially created a community farm on SFPUC owned land. So they converted about five acres of land that's next to a community park into an urban farm. And community members can come here to grow their own medicine and food. And so the park and the new farm are really important resilience assets for the community. And so community members went door to door and surveyed all of the residents in the area to learn about what are their resilience priorities that the park and the farm can help with. And so they collected all of this data and came up with very specific resilience strategies that were informed by residents in the community, including a lot of youth. And through this project, the residents were able to increase their capacity to learn how to get involved in different adaptation and resilience planning, and they were able to create strategies that meet community needs in a very culturally relevant way. And finally, analysis is the last step and is extremely important. Um, this involves regularly evaluating the equity progress that a different program or policy um, has to make sure that uh, if it's not meeting those goals, that we're going to revisit the program or policy um, to create stronger equity outcomes. And this was honestly the hardest step to find examples for. We reviewed, again, over about 30 different policies or programs, and almost all of them didn't include an equity analysis. Um, and so that's a huge gap for us, and one thing that we're going to be working on is how do we actually assess transformative um, impact that we're seeing in communities as a result of policies and programs. Uh, but I did want to share one example that I found. So earlier this summer, the San Francisco Board of Supervisors approved legislation to create an Office of Racial Equity. And for this office, each city department would have to adopt an action plan that states how they plan to address racial disparities um, in their department. And importantly, they're going to have to find ways to measure that equity progress. And so out of this effort, they're going to be creating new sorts 
of analysis tools to track the equity impact that they're creating. And so this effort just got approved this summer. So we'll have to wait and see how it's implemented. But um, I think it's worth keeping on our radar as we develop new tools in case they're, um, the tools can be used in our work or can be replicated in other work that we're doing. So that's, that was the last step. Um, again, just to summarize, the main takeaway here is that whatever adaptation resilience effort is being developed, we want to see equity meaningfully embedded in these four categories, and this can essentially serve as a blueprint or a roadmap on how to make equity real. Um, and I just went through a few examples, but our guidebook is very long. I have a copy of it here. It's about 100 pages, um, and it provides a lot of best practices and other examples for how to embed equity in these four categories for any sort of grant programs or policies that are being developed. Um, and so, yeah, that concludes the presentation. I know it was a lot of information to um, process, so I did want to just share some guiding questions uh, for the group discussion, and also happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, and the last slide, I'll just skip to that real quick, um, has a link to the full report as well as my contact information um, in case you have any questions that I don't get to answer today. Thank you. So why don't we start with questions in the room here, but folks on the phone, um, if you could send in your questions now, we can work through those as well. Any questions? I can start with one. Um, Cal and Virus Screen 4.0 update is up there. And yeah. I'm interested to hear about that because we are using 3.0. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so I think, I know A10 presented here recently. Um, we're just curious because right now Cal and Bioscreen is a tool that a lot of um, the organizations that we work with use to identify disadvantaged communities and communities that are overburdened by pollution. Um, but it doesn't look at climate risk or climate exposure. And so given that Cal and Bioscreen is going to be updated, Soon, we're just curious if that is one way for that tool to um, now include climate risk so that the map looks at socioeconomic burdens, um, pollution burdens, and the other ones it currently looks at in addition to climate risk uh, so that we can better identify which communities are going to be most vulnerable based on all of those things. So, yeah. Cool. Do you know when there's something up there? I believe it's next year, but I'm not 100% sure. But yeah, it should be coming up soon. So, um, one of the things we've gotten a lot of feedback on is um, that it would be really helpful to be able to pay community members when they're engaged in um, advising mm -hmm. us and, um, you know, in, like outreach workshops and, and also like um, spreading the word about our program. Um, and so I'm just wondering if you came across examples of government agencies that are doing that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I would echo that. I think uh, a lot of the communities that we work with um, tend to get a lot of requests from government to do the community engagement, but it is a, a big time intensive and resource intensive ask on their part. So really appreciate the question. Um, I would say that, for instance, a lot of uh, local governments that we've worked with are doing that. For instance, the um, LA uh, sustainability plan that I share, they did, oh my gosh, I think they conducted over like 200 meetings or something to inform the development of that plan. And they provided a lot of organizations with stipends so that they were able to do that work in a really meaningful way and be um, recognized for the work that they're doing. Um, that's a, I know it's a, a big gap that we're seeing just because of funding constraints, but um, I think we're trying to change the narrative so that the communities that we work with and community-based organizations that are providing this information are providing it in a, not in an extractive way, but are seen as true partners working with government to provide that information. You mentioned the LA County Measure A um, mm -hmm. in the equitable poll process section and how they made a really like in-depth community needs assessment. Was that, do you know if that was funded by the measure, like that was required by the bond? I'm not sure exactly where the funding for that came from. Um, I'd be curious to look into that as well. Uh, but ultimately, yeah, they were able to secure funding to do the extensive community um, engagement there. Um, but I'm not 100% sure where the funding came from. Yeah. 
does your guidebook um, provide suggestions for the um, the fourth component, which was assessing a project impact on equity? I forget that you. Yeah, the um, analysis piece. Yeah, the analysis piece. Mm -hmm. I, I could see that just in relation to your first question there. I mean, I could see that being something that we share with our grantees when thinking about, you know, because a lot of our projects come with monitoring periods and assessments yeah. and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, making the assessment more through an equity lens. Right. Does, so does, um, does the guidebook have suggestions on that? Yeah, so it does. And I think what was difficult to find were like the specific equity metrics and indicators to use to track progress. But what we were able to find is different frameworks um, to use to be able to um, plug in those metrics and indicators. So for instance, um, Transformative Climate Communities Program is one that we work closely on, and there's a lot of transformative elements, and uh, we want to make sure that we're able to track that progress. And so they have sort of just a, a framework on how to track the equity um, progress that different communities are advancing in their projects. Um, and so that's one that I think we can replicate and use in all sorts of different grant programs. Um, and then I would say that um, UCLA Luskin Center, they've actually been hired to figure out how do we come up with those specific equity metrics and indicators for TCC. Um, and they're working on that right now. And so we've been following the progress that they're um, making. But I think that work will be really instrumental in helping us figure out what does that set of metrics and indicators look like, while also recognizing that it's so specific to the project being developed. And so there needs to be this balance between creating the indicators, but having a lot of flexibility depending on the project. Yeah. What are your suggestions for engaging people in the process? You know, in communities where people might have two jobs or even three jobs, yeah. have children, how do you get them to participate? How do you solicit them? Yeah, that's a, it's a big question. Um, involves a lot of different steps. I think one, like even one thing that we always say is that we should be meeting communities where they're at. For instance, if they do, if they are working multiple jobs or if they have children and they can't afford childcare, um, how can we, instead of asking them to come to our offices, meet them at places that they would otherwise be going anyway, whether it's a church or a school, somewhere that's in their community. Um, to ensure that they're able to, it kind of gets rid of like access and transportation barriers. But in addition to that, even if we've heard some of our government partners who will do that, but if there's no trust built in that community, nobody's gonna come to the event even if it's held at a place in their community. And so I feel like that trust building piece is really important for us. And that requires, I think, Kind of like if you were if you live in a neighborhood and you and you want to make an ask of your neighbor you wouldn't just go up to them and ask them something immediately you would get to know them you would kind of learn what their interests are or whatever and then slowly be able to build a relationship and make that ask and so that's kind of the thinking that we have for how do we engage with communities is to see them as neighbors and true partners mm -hmm. where um, we're able to build that trust um, by engaging continuously not only when we need their help um, so that when we do need their help um, they're, they aren't as concerned about how that information is going to be used or whether or not they're going to be treated respectfully, et cetera. Um, and there's so much more that can go into the engagement piece. Um, I only touched on a couple of things, but the um, California Environmental Justice Alliance came out with this toolkit for SB 1000. Um, and it essentially provides like best practices for community engagement. And we reference them in our report and they go through step by step, like how do you build that trust? How do you do um, set up like community advisory boards, for example, um, to ensure that you're getting input and perspectives from community members? So I would say there's a lot of great resources and tools out there um, that we include in the book too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, one of the things that I personally always struggle with is this idea of building um, resilience or building building resilient communities without building likelihood of displacement. Yeah. And and I and a lot of what I've read to this point like doesn't seem to really get at this like how to prevent the market system from doing what the market system does. And I'm wondering if in in Greenlining's work, like are you seeing new things being developed in that way? Like new suggestions or strategies? For the development without displacement. Yeah, yeah that's um, a really big question because we want our communities to get investments, but we don't want those investments to lead to gentrification and displacement. 
Um, and honestly, we don't have a perfect answer solution for that. Um, what I can say is that, again, TCC is an, a program that we really champion, and they require the um, project applicants to, they provide a list of like anti-displacement strategies for small businesses and residents, um, and they require applicants to um, include some of those displacement mitigation strategies in their project from the beginning so that you're able to prevent all of this before uh, very proactively. Um, but we also work with the Urban Displacement Project, and I think they, they'd be a really good organization to learn more about because they're, they're doing a lot of the data and research that Greenlining doesn't do, but definitely helps inform the kind of advocacy that we uh, want to work towards. Yeah, and then um, our report includes um, kind of a, a reference to all different types of um, anti-displacement strategies that we've seen other programs um, try to do. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. We have a question here um, from listeners online. Are there cross-disciplinary groups that can look at things like that, that can look at how things like environmental restoration and homelessness groups can support? Like a, sorry, what, what are they asking? Is there like a network? Are, yeah. Are there any like yeah groups that are trying to like bring these two sectors together? Mm -hmm. And I, th I think uh, environmental restoration and homelessness are examples. But yeah. like, you know, Bringing sectors together in these questions. Right. Um, not that I know of. I think there's a need for that. Um, I'd be curious if anyone else knows about kind of networks or coalitions that are working to advance what I'm hearing is like multiple different resilience strategies at the same time. Um, I, yeah, we have not come across that. I think that's actually one gap that we're seeing is even in the um, like environmental justice space, there isn't really a coalition to advance climate justice in the context of like adaptation and resilience. And so in my work, I'm kind of just doing that on a very ad hoc basis and meeting with different partners and learning what they're doing and trying to do that coordination. But um, I know, for instance, there's like a climate adaptation forum that'll happening that'll be happening later in 2020, and that might be one venue to kind of bring together stakeholders and government and other folks who are working on adaptation from multiple different um, lenses to see what sort of like network or coalition could be created. But yeah, I don't think there is one that I know of right now. Yeah. I think, Dan, you might know about, I think we're involved in the um, climate equity group in the Central Coast. I was looking around to see if any Central Coast people were here. <clears throat> we do have, so I, I think, are you thinking of rape, the Climate Justice Network? Yeah. yeah, so there's there's a Climate Justice Network that's Central Coast specific that one of our oh, staff okay. members works on. Okay. Um, you know, it's regional to Central Coast counties, mm -hmm. but um, it's starting to work on that sort of thing. And then we also have various people working in different um, climate collaboratives around the state. Yeah, right. Um, and I think those groups are starting to incorporate more EJ groups and trying to actively recruit people from that, that yeah. sector. Yeah. There's, there's also another group called the Clean Water Coalition that uh, works both in the Santa Ana River Parkway and in the Russian River. Mm -hmm. They work with the homeless population and teach um, whatever you bring, like kind of bring out to to the homeless population. What was the name again? The Clean Water Coalition. <laughs> so for folks on the phone, that's Clean Water Coalition. It's another group that might be doing this sort of work. Another question we have online. This is the last question that has come in from folks online. So um, if you're on the phone, now's your last chance to get these questions in. Um, for the assessment of different plans and policies, can you say more about how they were scored in the report? Um, with an example, what are the like the different types of community engagement that might make a plan score higher or lower? Yeah, it's been a little it's been a little while since I've looked at that assessment. So I just want to make sure I represent it accurately. Um, yeah, so basically the entire guidebook has different examples for best practices for like community engagement and um, things you want to see in those uh, four categories that I shared. And so that was kind of the criteria that we use to assess different programs. And so for instance, um, for an equitable process, things like authentic and meaningful community engagement was a rubric that we use. And then we have specific parameters around what that actually looks like and how that's showing up in different efforts. Um, or for instance, um, 
if it's a grant program, are community-based organizations or nonprofits or tribal governments um, eligible as applicants to apply for funding for some of these things? Or is there dedicated funding for like community engagement and outreach or technical assistance, which are all real big needs that we're seeing? Um, and so in our table of contents in our report, we have all of the different criteria that we use to assess the program. And then essentially, if you're looking at your own programs or policies that you're working on, you can use um, this introduction and table of contents and be like, oh, I wanna do these things in my program and then be able to turn to the corresponding page and, and learn about some of those best practices. Um, but uh, yeah, the full analysis is in the report and the appendix, yeah. Uh, we have a note from, uh, from someone online, another good Bay Area coalition that we were like a mm -hmm. coalition we were discussing before, uh, six wins for social equity, and they provided the link so I can provide okay. that to everyone okay. after this as well. Okay. Um, and then another comment that came in um, to add on to the list of historically racist policies: the California alien land laws from the 1920s to the 1950s prevented Asian immigrants from becoming U.S. citizens or owning property. Just a, another one that someone. Um, are there any other questions in the room? Are you familiar with the California Air Resources Board, um, like their metric for boring community engagement? And yes, we have to get on how that. Yeah. Um, we reviewed it, and I think we've included some examples in here. I think I think it was pretty strong, from what I recall. Um, and then we just want to supplement that with like what other community-based organizations are saying are good practices for engagement. Um, but yeah, I definitely think that's a good starting point to learn about different um, engagement practices from agencies. Um, one of the things that comes up a lot for us is the capacity building question, yeah. um, and. So I'm wondering, yeah, what came out of your research in terms of like what's effective? And because yeah. one of the things we worry about is putting our grantees at risk if yeah. they don't have the capacity to right. financially manage the project, then they could be on the hook for money that they didn't think that they needed to pay and so forth. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we capacity building comes up in all of the work or like the lack of capacity. And as a result of that, Greenlining actually co-sponsored a bill last year, um, SB 1072, um, and it's a capacity building bill. Because right now, even for a program like Transformative Climate Communities, um, we see that <coughs> as a, a great program that we want to see replicated. But for instance, the application is so, um, it's just very dense, it takes a lot of time. And while it's gonna, it will create very transformative projects, it's like if you don't have the capacity on the front end to do that work, then that program may not be beneficial for a community, right? Um, and so we recognize that gap. And right now we don't honestly have a list. We have like different best practices to build capacity, but it's hard to get funding for that. And then it's hard to um, basically find trainers to do that sort of work. And so the bill that we, it passed last year and essentially would create different uh, climate collaboratives around the state of California. And you can, the way they function is sort of as like a broker between um, community members or, or different like um, applicants who are interested in advancing climate projects in their communities. And the collaborative can then connect them to different government agencies or other um, groups that they may not have a relationship with to assist with that sort of relationship building. But in addition to that, it would provide resources on like technical assistance, or, like how do you write a grant application to be competitive? Um, and so right now the bill passed, but it didn't have funding attached to it. Um, so uh, we wanna make sure there's funding there. Um, so right now we're working on uh, securing funding for it. It would be administered by the Strategic Growth Council, and uh, we really appreciate working with them. They have very like, transparent processes. Um, so yeah, I mean, we recognize that gap, and that's why we saw the need to create statewide legislation to um, build capacity in very under-resourced communities. Um, we're gonna continue trying to, yeah, find ways to do that. And I really use that, and I think that's a great initiative, and I think it gets funded. Yeah. One of the things I think that we, well, I wonder if you have recommendations about is the tension or the difference whether we should do all competitive grant funding versus targeted funding because mm -hmm. when you have competitive rounds mm -hmm. you're necessarily like having a hurdle yeah. of entry um, and do you have any recommendations right. about 
the, the pros and cons of either model of um, either model of public funding? Yeah. Um, I think uh, in our work, we would like to see more targeted funding um, to under-resourced or disadvantaged communities. Um, but I recognize that there might be grant programs where that's just not possible to do. And so one thing that we've seen is that if it's a grant program that um, is like has a competitive application, um, some of them will have specific carve-outs. It'll be like 30% of the funding will go to disadvantaged communities or other um, rural communities, for instance. So that's a way to guarantee that at least um, some of those projects will have to meet those um, applicants and those populations. Um, but I think overall, the targeted funding definitely helps to ensure that those communities are able to be competitive applicants. Um, and what we often see is that even if there is that carve out, there has to be resources for the technical assistance or like capacity building to ensure that they're still able to do that work. But yeah. One more question on, on the line here. How many governments have strategic plans to advance racial equity that can support climate adaptation and community resilience? So you, you mentioned San Francisco, but maybe oh. other cases. <laughs> um, I'm not, I don't know that number on the top of my head. Um, I know GARE, though, is really um, important. I don't know if um, this agency has worked with GARE, but I know that they're kind of trying to do a lot of interagency work to advance racial equity. Um, but don't quote me on it, but at least in California, I'm not sure of other specific offices for racial equity that exist. So that's why I think we're really interested to kind of see the work that they're doing. And I'd be curious to see around the country if there are other offices like For assessing a benefit to a disadvantaged community or an underserved community, the state typically works with mapping, mm -hmm. which is kind of an easy yeah. way to do it, but um, doesn't necessarily bring in all the nuance. And, and yeah. Are, are, are there other metrics that, that could be kind of institutionalized in a way that um, allow agencies to better understand if a project is going to benefit. Right. Um, any ideas or thoughts around that? Yeah, no, it's a really um, important question. I think, yeah, data mapping and science doesn't tell the story alone. And so while Cal and Biosprint, for example, can identify where a disadvantaged community is, it doesn't necessarily mean that a project is going to be relevant or meaningful to that community just by bringing it there. And so what we always recommend is um, complementing any sort of mapping or data with ground truthing. By that we mean um, a lot of the community engagement piece. So for instance, going into communities, learning about what their needs and priorities are. And if there is a project that a um, grantee wants to implement in that community, how can they early on engage the community and learn whether or not that project is going to be relevant in addressing their urgent needs? Um, because so often we see, especially around technology, that the tech is developed first and then is trying to address problems in a community versus understanding what the community issues are and then developing the solutions around that. Um, so I think, yeah, it just has to be a multi-pronged approach. We're using the mapping um, and science initially, but making sure that it's uh, complemented by um, kind of the experiential knowledge um, from community members who are best suited to know the kind of issues that they're dealing with. Yeah. There's another question online. Um, have you thought about or would you recommend including culture and heritage as components that can strengthen community resilience in this area? Yes, definitely. Um, yeah, what we actually talk about in the report is uh, strategy, like how to develop culturally relevant strategies. Um, because, for instance, a lot of the communities we work with, um, English is not widely spoken, so making sure that uh, materials are translated in, in different languages. Um, but beyond that, there's so many different cultural sensitivities to be aware of to make sure that any sort of engagement is happening in a very respectful way that um, responds to a community's different culture. Um, so short answer is yes, absolutely. And we uh, have some um, tips and like best practices on how to develop culturally relevant strategies. All right. Thank you so much for yeah. joining us today. And for people on the phone, uh, we'll be sending out these slides and the links as well afterwards. So thanks for joining us as well.
and um, I have executive summaries of our report here uh, in case anybody wanted to go to the meeting.